Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Sports Week, episode 60. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm Eddie Kalegi. Tim Moore not here this week. I won't be here next week as I have broadcasting camp, so uh, he'll be hosting with another co-host next week, and then we'll be back together a couple of weeks down the line. But a lot to get to on this episode. We will have a guest in just a few minutes. We'll be joined by John Boccio to talk about the Phoenix Suns moving on to the NBA Finals, the Hawks and Bucks both with injured stars trying to join them and all the latest in the Euro 2020 soccer tournament. But there's a few topics I wanted to get to first. And we'll start with two of the major European sporting events that happen every year that are going on right now that have both ran into some obstacles and controversy. And we're going to start with the Tour de France, which has always drawn the attention of the public for the major accidents that occasionally happen and are often caused by some weird things such as protests, cars being in the way, and of course spectators not being careful. And that's what we saw again. And lots of people are familiar. I mean, unless you live under a rock you've seen in the last few days, um, the crash from the opening stage of this year's tour on Monday. Basically what happened, for people who don't aren't really familiar with the Tour de France, of course, it's the big cycling event, the biggest cycling event in the world. And they race all the way through France it starts in the suburbs, it ends in Paris. So you're going through small towns, you're going through these little villages. And it's a big tradition where all the fans line up to get to watch the athletes and they stand right up next to the street, which has caused some issues before, but not nearly to the degree of what we saw in the opening stage on Monday. Tony Martin, who was in third place at the time of the Peloton, which was about 150 cyclists all bunched together, was riding along the side of the road when a fan started holding out a sign, a cardboard sign with a message in French, facing towards the TV camera, which was in front of the riders instead of towards the riders, so she couldn't see them coming, and then got clobbered by Tony Martin. He fell, and about 50 other riders crashed into them, four of them too injured now to even continue with the tour and taken out of this three-week event on the first day. Now, this is not the first time, like I said, but this is probably the most egregious we've seen so far. And it really comes down to the cycling board and Tour de France officials to start considering what they can do heading into next year and beyond to try to curb these types of incidents. Because well, like I said, this may have been the worst, but it's certainly not isolated. This has happened many times before. So there are actions that need to be taken and I know there's a special quality to the Tour de France because fans, this is the only sport, a major sporting event, where you can basically go outside of your small French village home and have a major sporting event going on literally in your backyard. And getting to watch for those 30 seconds when the Peloton comes by is probably a huge experience and a bucket list experience for so many French residents. But having no dividers whatsoever, I mean, I'm amazed there aren't as many incidents as there have been because you have fans that come up who are trying to spray water and dump water on these athletes to hydrate them when they're trying to ride their bikes at 50 miles an hour on a bumpy French dirt road. I mean, it's, it's you're going to run into problems. So I really think solutions need to be considered to try to create some sort of space of separation between the fans and the riders while still giving them that true experience that makes the Tour de France so special. Shifting gears to the other European sporting event that's run into some problems, it's Wimbledon. Um, there was no Wimbledon last year, but one of the things, I watch a lot of these tennis majors, what I always see in Wimbledon compared to the other three are injuries, retirees, because of slip and falls, more so than the other three. Of course, this is the only major open tournament played on grass, but... Wimbledon, especially, and we've seen, especially on the big courts, on center court, court number one, the two primary courts where the biggest matches happen. We see all these slip and fall incidents, players tweaking ankles, tweaking knees, and not being able to continue. And we've run into that yet again right here um, with two major injuries back to back on, in the first round. It started with Andy Manorino, who was playing the game of his life against Roger Federer, putting up a nice fight. Had an awkward fall, hurt his knee, had to retire. And then Serena Williams, who is one of the few big names even in the women's bracket this year with Naomi Osaka and Simona Halep, both dropping out of the Wimbledon tournament. Serena Williams fell, tweaked her ankle, and that was the end of it for her. And she's, of course, what draws major intrigue 
to the women's side of the bracket, of course, being the legend that she is and one of the best female tennis players of all time. This has got to be something that Wimbledon has to address going into the future. This is too many times now where we've seen athletes fall, and it happens every year. And it's usually in the first or second round as they get adjusted to playing on the grass court because there's really nothing like it. Now, Patrick McEnroe on the broadcast did mention maybe a suggestion would be adding some sort of turf in to add a little more grip and make it less slippery. But there are two problems with that. The first one is, like, you, you if you do that, if you have turf in some spots, more a little heavier, of course, turf is rubberized. And tennis is a sport where you rely on the ball bouncing. And not having even bouncing is going to throw off the entire game. And, of course, Wimbledon, they all care about the pageantry and the beauty. And I want 100% pure grass. And so I don't think they're going to uh, do anything to oppose that. But two major European sporting events that have both run into some problems but still have been very fun to watch here early in the summer. And I can't wait to see what's going to go on here. Another topic of conversation, we got to shift gears to NASCAR a little bit because I know people are critical of Pocono Raceway and the lack of interest in some of those races. They can be a bore sometimes, and I'm going to agree with you there. But this weekend, the two cup races, both very exciting. We start with Saturday, some good two and three wide racing throughout the field, and then Kyle Larson gets challenged trying to pass Alex Bowman, who snuck to the lead on older tires, and it ultimately cost him as he blew a tire in the final turn while leading Missing out on his fourth consecutive points race win, his fifth consecutive cup win overall, couldn't do either as he crashed into the wall with a blown tire and teammate Alex Bowman went to victory lane. And then I think Sunday was even more interesting because there were so many storylines going on in that race. You had, first of all, for the Pocono doubleheader, they invert the top 20. So from the previous race to set the lineup. So you had faster cars starting in the middle of the field. Kyle Larson, who has been the best cup driver really, over the last 10 races, had to start at the back because he had to switch to a backup car after blowing a tire the day before. So you had him trying to make his way through the field. The people starting 20th that were fast, like Kyle Busch, William Byron, Alex Bowman, trying to make their way to the front of the field. And then the added laps through in pit strategy and people trying to make it on fuel. So we had all three of those things going on at the same time. It was really fun to watch. And Kyle Busch gets another Pocono win. How about that with the strategy? Pitting a lap later than teammate Denny Hamlin on the last full cycle of green flag pit stops. It paid off and got the 18 to victory lane for the second time this season. Um, really fun race. Bubba Wallace, by the way, first top five with 23-11 racing. So I really enjoyed watching it personally. And I think NASCAR has hit something good with the Pocono doubleheader. Because I, I don't think Pocono really merits having two separate weekend dates especially when they were only spaced out by about six weeks traditionally with one at the end of June, one right at the beginning of August. But combining everything into one action-packed weekend with five races, if you include ARCA as well, I think it was a good choice by NASCAR. I don't think you should fully abandon Pocono. I, I think they have a nice core base there of fans that support it. You saw the Pocono grandstands really packed for this race. Um, and nice to see some full crowds back here for stock car racing, first at Nashville and now at Pocono. But Overall, I think those two races really exceeded my expectations. Um, and last thing before we bring in John Baccio, on the NASCAR side of things, the big news, Team Trackhouse, co-owned by Pitbull and Justin Marks, purchasing Chip Ganassi Racing in a move nobody saw coming. Ganassi will be out of NASCAR after this season, which leaves questions about Kurt Busch and Ross Chastain, their futures. Will one of them get a second Trackhouse car? Now, Trackhouse, I think, acquires two charters, so now they'll have three charters, but only two cars that they're planning on, which means they're going to be leasing a charter out. Will that potentially go to 2311 Racing? Will that potentially go to Junior Motorsports? So many questions thrown in, but crazy to think that the team that was originally owned by Dale Earnhardt, the Intimidator, is now owned by Dale Pitbull, Mr. 305. Crazy to see how that's all changed, but Chip Ganassi Racing has not had nearly the success in NASCAR that they have had in open wheel with IndyCar. Um, still surprising to see such a long team. They've been in the sport for over two decades, seeing them here for so long. They've had Daytona 500 wins with Jamie McMurray, um, some great wins with Montoya and Kyle Larson in the past as well, and Kurt Busch. But uh, overall, I think a great opportunity, perfect time for Chip Ganassi to move out and focus on IndyCar. 
A great chance here for Justin Marks and Pitbull to build a really strong team. But we're going to move on now, talk a little NBA, and talk a little soccer with our guest, John Baccio. Okay. Well, we got John Baccio here to talk a little NBA, talk a little soccer. JB, thanks for joining us again here in Sports Big. No problem. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start with the Western Conference Finals. They are over in the Phoenix Suns. Who saw this coming? Making it to the NBA Finals. Chris Paul comes back from the health and safety protocols. Devin Booker with his broken nose. Didn't play great in the series, but they still got the job done. DeAndre Ayton was a beast on the boards all six games. And for the Clippers, another tough ending. Do you think this would have gone any differently if Kawhi Leonard had been healthy for the series for the Clippers? You know what? That's been a question for a long, long time now. And my true answer is no. I really don't think it would have been a different series without Kawhi. Obviously, you get that extra added defense, which would be nice in this series. You get him to go on possibly Devin Booker, even uh, Chris Paul down the stretch. But I think overall, Kawhi's scoring might have helped. But in a game like this, I don't think Kawhi Leonard would have made much of a difference. If Chris Paul is dropping 40, he's dropping 40 either way. And Tyron Lue is a guy that does not like to make many changes. Throughout the games, we always saw he would stick with his guys. For example, in game six, we saw Nick Batum on Devin Booker. Devin Booker was going good in the first half. He didn't change anything. Then we saw Patrick Beverly on Chris Paul and down the stretch. We all know what happened. Chris Paul went for 40, and Tyron Lue still had yet to do anything about the situation. He refused to put on a four-time all-defense guy in Paul George on either of those two guys to try to, to just slow down the momentum in general. There was really nothing that could have changed this series because I don't think that Tyron Lue would have done anything differently than what he did already. And I know a lot of people like to praise Tyron Lue that he did win the championship in Cleveland and now got the Clippers over the hump. But some of his rotations were a little questionable this series, especially on the buzzer beater, um, on the lob to DeAndre Dayton when he had DeMarcus Cousins guarding on the ball instead of on Ayton when he was the center on the floor. But some questionable decisions, but for the Clippers, still I think it was a good season to at least get over the hump and at least compete in the conference finals and win a couple of games, even though they were without Kawhi Leonard. And they'll be back next season ready to face off. But with Phoenix, I was talking about this with Tim on our last show, about how they are a completely different dynamic than what we've seen in the NBA in the past 10, 15 years. It's always these super teams that are succeeding where they'll have a big three or a dynamic duo. And you've seen something completely different here in Phoenix with one star in Chris Paul, another up and coming star in Devin Booker, and then a lot of youth and a lot of role players that have all come together to create a great roster. So what do you think has really worked for Phoenix this year to kind of change the dynamic here in the NBA? You know what? No. Oh. <laughs> you know what? It's been a lot of up and down for Phoenix. Their supporting cast I think is just the biggest thing that's happened in this series. And the biggest thing that I think goes super under the radar is Jay Crowder. The unsung hero of this entire playoff run has been Jay Crowder. He's been there when you need a bucket. He's been there when you need a stop. He's been there when you need a lob to DeAndre Ayton within 0.9 seconds. He has been phenomenal this playoff series. And another X factor for the Phoenix Suns has been Mikhail Bridges. He's another guy that he plays his role, does nothing other than that, but he's going to play it to the best of his ability. And there is absolutely no stopping him when he's hot. No one talks about these smaller guys on the team. People will say, oh, they don't have this big team, but they're really successful. And I think that's 100% true. But the biggest thing is that the supporting cast has so much chemistry and they know what they're there to do. They do nothing other than it. They let their stars do their thing. They let DeAndre Ayton get on the boards. They let Devin Booker go off for 40 when he needs to. And they let Chris Paul get the assists, get in the passing lanes, get all of those points that he needs to get as soon as he wants them. So I think overall, the biggest thing for Phoenix this playoff run has been that supporting cast. Those guys that you don't get much talk about, but they are really, really good. Yeah, and one more thing with Phoenix. Like, so many people might say they're only in this position because of the injuries. And maybe they might, might not have made the finals if it was a healthy Clippers or a healthy Lakers. But 
they're still a really good team this season. Let's not forget last year in the bubble when everybody was fully tooled, they went 8-0 and nearly came, overcame a five-game deficit. They barely even qualified to play in the bubble, and then they ended up only a half game out of the play-in tournament at the end for making it into the postseason. So th this is a really well-coached team by Monty Williams. James Jones, the GM, did a great job bringing in Chris Paul, fitting together some of these under-the-radar pieces like Jay Crowder and Frank Kaminsky to really put together a nice roster, and I'm really excited to see what they can do in the finals. But let's shift gears. Eastern Conference Finals. Trey Young is now hurt. Giannis Antetokounmpo is now hurt. There's really uncertainty with both of them. You'd think Giannis' injury might be a little more severe than Trey's, but you never know. And we're entering Game 5 in an even 2-2 series. Two teams with great depth and a lot of young talent, similar to Phoenix in some ways, but without their stars. Who do you think is in a better position right now to reach the NBA Finals from the East? Unfortunately, I'm going to have to say that the Atlanta Hawks are in the better position. And I'm a Knicks fan, and it's painful to say, but the Atlanta Hawks just looked so dominant in Game 4. I mean, it, it, Game 5 is going to be a bit of a toss-up because you never know. Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday just did not look – or Chris Middleton looked good in Game 4, but Drew Holiday just – has not brought it on the offensive side of the ball in this playoff run. He's only been averaging 15 throughout this entire playoffs. And I'm sorry, but that's just sad. Drew Holiday is the third option on that team, and he's averaging the fourth most points. Brooke Lopez is averaging more than him throughout this playoffs. And I hate to say it, but Drew Holiday is going to need to step up on the offensive side of the ball if they want to win this series. Giannis is a huge hit to this team. He plays for the perimeter. He plays on the inside. He does whatever you want him to do. He'll lock up their best player if Bud actually help, if Bud actually allowed Giannis to. That's besides the point, though. I just think Hawks are better coached. They've got the better depth. They've got the players that want to step up in big moments, like Kevin Herter, like even a Cam Reddish, like Bojan Bogdanovich, like Lou Williams. There's just so much that you have to handle when you're going against the Atlanta Hawks depth team. Trey Young is obviously a big hit, uh, but he's most likely going to be back for game five, so you don't know what's going to happen there. And then Giannis was actually listed as doubtful for next game. So at least we're hearing that there, it isn't the worst injury in the world, even though the hyperextension did look pretty disgusting. But I think Atlanta is in the best spot overall and that's just purely because there is so much that you need to worry about when going against that team yeah and without Antetokounmpo it's a major hit because that's the only thing that the Hawks can't contain because they don't really have a defender who's really fit perfectly to guard Giannis because Capella does not have the mobility Collins does not have the height and Giannis is able to just bully both of them inside and draw fouls against them. And even if he's going to take 15 seconds to shoot a free throw, he's going to make a decent amount of them and be able to help out his team. But with Atlanta, we have seen them do well, even when Trey Young wasn't effective. Let's not forget the clincher against Philadelphia. He was like 5 for 23 from the field in that game. It was Kevin Herter and Cam Reddish and John Collins who were the ones who came up the biggest in that game. So I think that the Hawks, I agree with you, are in a better position if Trey Young is hurt than the Bucks are without Giannis. And anybody in the NBA who could have potentially thought that we'd be talking about a Phoenix Suns-Atlanta Hawks final, I mean, it's been a crazy year in the NBA. But last thing here on basketball, I, I was saying this to Tim and Raheel a couple weeks ago. I think this is good for the sport because there's so many people who are against these super teams and whatever. And to have at least one year where you see these unsung heroes coming through, whether it's Milwaukee or Atlanta who makes it to the finals, I think it's a really good sign for the NBA to show some diversity in a sport that's always just considered to just be the four to six super teams just dominating every year. One million percent. And I think it even goes back to last year again in the bubble. How much fun was everybody having when the Miami Heat were making that finals run and got to the NBA finals? But then the Western Conference, it felt like nobody was watching the games. Everybody was tuned in to see Miami Heat. Who are they going to beat next? They beat Indiana. They swept Indiana in the first round. Then they went on to beat Milwaukee in five. Then they beat... Jason Tatum and the Celtics in six, and it's exactly like this year. We're not seeing those ginormous teams. And someone posed the question. They were saying, if you walked up to four different people right now and asked them, 
who is going to make the finals, you might have gotten four different answers when the Los Angeles Clippers were still in. The Phoenix Suns were making a great case. The Clippers were making a great case because Paul George was having possibly the best playoffs of his career. And now it's the Hawks and the Bucks. I think this playoffs has been phenomenal for NBA publicity. I've been having tons of fun watching this playoffs because you simply don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, who would have who would have expected Trey Young to be doing everything that he's doing right now, shushing the garden in the playoffs? I mean, do, doing everything that he's doing. He, it, it's insane to see. And I think even uh, without injuries, I think the Nets box series would have been at least more fun. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have gone seven games. Maybe the Milwaukee Bucks aren't in the finals right now or conference finals rather, but I think it's just fun to watch these little small market teams get to that final stage and be able to compete for an NBA championship. So let's shift gears. One last thing I want to talk about is the Euro 2020 tournament, which was obviously postponed last year, happening this year. And I'm not a big soccer guy, but I did notice one big thing, that France game, where France, who are defending World Cup champs, somehow lost and Mbappe missed a potential game-winning uh, kick and penalty kicks to fall there. Uh, what are some of the big storylines we've seen so far in Euro 2020 and other big surprises aside from France's defeat? I mean, <laughs> France's defeat is the biggest storyline at the end of the day. What was that game? I was lost for words while watching that. Switzerland just looked better. I hate to say it, but France really did not play that well. Yes, they topped the group of death, and that was a fun little thing to see. Uh, Portugal, obviously, Portugal fan, you can kind of see the flag in the back. But it was, I mean, we were were playing god-awful. But France were kind of playing god-awful, too, for their own standards. They were the favorites going into this tournament. But I think another huge storyline for this is Italy. Who expected Italy to be this dominant of a side? They went over 1,000 minutes without conceding a goal, and they only conceded one against Austria in extra time. They pull out that game 2-1. And they are now on a 28-game unbeaten streak, 16 of those games being shutouts. It is crazy to watch this team perform. They're going against Belgium in the next round, and I think, I'm going to say it right now, they dominate Belgium. Belgium really did not look great against one of the worst sides in in the entire bracket, Portugal. We had no source of offense other than crossing in the ball and just hoping that Ronaldo would jump up and score a header. So I think Italy, I think they're the biggest storyline right now after France going out. Italy just have, they could not look better right now, in my opinion. Donnarumma has been being, oh my God, he has been so good. He's barely got the ball shot to him. That's another story. But Donnarumma has been phenomenal. Chiro Mobile, one of the leading scorers in the Euros right now. There's nothing other to, to say than Italy will most likely go on to win Euro 2020. It's weird to say that it's 2020 because it did get pushed back. And I highly doubt one year ago that we would be saying the same stuff about Italy. But I think they are European championship favorites right now. Well, I think that's something else, too, that people kind of forget about. Since it was a year after, it's been so long since we had one of these national soccer tournaments on such a big stage, other than just playing the occasional friendly or some sort of mini tournament. These teams getting back into the regiment, playing group play, and then single elimination. I think that's kind of thrown off sort of the chemistry between some of these rosters who for some haven't really had that full experience since the World Cup back in 2018. But John Bocci, go ahead. One second. One more thing that I can build off off of you. England. England is a prime example of people not really being able to get into those chances. Declan Rice, this is his first European tournament. Jack Relish, this is his first European tournament for England. And Jaden Sancho, an up-and-coming player, this is the first time that he's performed on a big stage for England. Those other guys like Harry Kane, Raheem Sterling's been phenomenal, but Harry Kane really has not been great. And I think that's because he really hasn't stepped into his role with this younger squad yet. And I think that's why England has kind of underperformed in this tournament. They beat Germany. They go on to play Ukraine. They'll probably end up winning that game, possibly even win their own bracket. But I think England is a prime example of these young teams not being able to form that chemistry just yet. Well, this is a good test for the World Cup coming up next year. So it's great to see all these guys back on the pitch. But John Baccio, thanks so much for joining us once again here on Sports Big. No problem.
All right, that'll wrap up this week's episode. A reminder that next week, Tim Moore will be hosting. It's not here today, but me and John actually will both be going to the Bruce Beck Sports Broadcasting Camp. We're super excited for that, but we hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll see you next week. I'm Eddie Kalegi signing off here on Sportspeak. We hope you have a great rest of your day.